The coronavirus has redefined our normal. Many things we took for granted are gone. If we let the things that we lost define us, then we lost ourselves when we lost them. But the truth is, the things that really matter, that should truly define us, haven't been lost at all. Good morning, everyone. We're so glad you could join us here at Shoreline Church this morning. Speaking of this morning, this morning I got on my computer early to reserve a, a workout time at the Monterey Sports Center. Now you can do that if you reserve ahead of time. And I was just thinking about all the years that I've gone to this place. Um, I love it there. And up until recently, my habit was I wake up at 4.15 in the morning, make coffee, have a little coffee, pray, read the news. Then I go to the church, or not the church, I'm in the church, to the sports center and stand in line to get in. I have to be there by, oh, 5.15 or so for very specific reasons. I want my favorite locker. And there's, at 5.15, there's about four or five people there ahead of me. One of them is Dave. And I love that Dave's there because he's gonna go in first and open my locker for me. So here's the way it works. I leave my warm bed, get in my warmed up car, drive to the sports center, get a little chilly walking from the car to the front of the building, endure the chill for 12 to 15 minutes, then go into a warmed up sports center. And I almost never wear a coat. If it's raining, I do, or if it's in the high 30s, I do. Invariably, and it's gone on three days a week, for 12 years, I walk up to the group and they're all wrapped and muffled and gloved and hatted and everything. And they say, aren't you cold? And I say, yes, I am. Why don't you wear a jacket or why don't you wear this or that? And the statement I started saying years ago is, well, comfort's the enemy. And there's a very specific reason that I feel that way. I do a lot of stuff that makes me uncomfortable for a bit. For example, dive in cold weather, ride my bike in cold weather, um, run up hills in hot weather, all these kinds of things. And I have this fear that if I start getting too comfortable, I'll lose my ability to stretch myself, to do the things I love to do. In fact, I even have another saying, first is comfort is the enemy. The other thing I kind of adopted for myself is, I have this personal fear, it's me. It may not be you, but it's me. If I get, if I get too uncomfortable, or, or I'm sorry, let me reverse it. If I get too comfortable, I can become disinterested in my own life. It's not strange, but I kind of think that. This morning, we're gonna talk about redefining comfort. Last week, Pastor Sean helped us understand how we redefine success why would we redefine either one? Because as Christians, we don't see these things the same way as we might if we weren't Christians. Success is different for a Christian than it is if you take Jesus out. And I, I submit comforts very similar in that regard. So, so we're going to explore what we mean by the word comfort. What's the difference between comforting another person, protecting them, or being comfortable. Now, to comfort or be comforted, that's not the same as be comfortable. But what do we often think of when we think of the word comfort? Well, in the right usage, in the right sense, it means we're coming alongside of somebody who's in trouble or hurting. We're offering them care if they've lost a loved one. Maybe a friend has lost a job and, and, and we're comforting them. They're concerned about income, how are they going to pay the bills? I have a friend who was just diagnosed with cancer, and I'm walking with him, and my goal is to comfort him. That's right comfort, I believe. I also spent a lot of time last year comforting people 
who were impacted by that terrible boat fire uh, of a dive boat in the Channel Islands. Many of us uh, were affected because the spouse of one of our dear dive friends was killed. And I received emails from all over saying, D, how do we, how do we talk to Dan? How do we talk to Dale? How do we talk to these people? How do we talk to Betty, you know, Jerry's wife? And so that was comfort in the right sense. Or, or I received a lot of comfort recently. I, I fell off my bike, broke a bunch of bones, and I got to tell you, I welcomed all the comfort I could get. So there's a time and a place for comfort. So how could comfort be the enemy? Why do we need to redefine comfort? I'm going to give you some quotes here from some very well-established, very successful people and see what you think. Here's one. Comfort is the enemy of success because the minute we feel comfortable, we stop growing, stop pushing, and stop trying to improve. That's by Adam Earhart, a marketing growth strategist well-known in the business world. Here's another one. I really like this one. A comfort zone is a beautiful place, but nothing grows there. That's by Robert Stevenson. He's a best-selling author and founder of Seeking Excellence Incorporated. And here's another one. Comfort, pause, the enemy of progress. P. T. Barnum. You might remember Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. Well, that was P. T. Barnum, the founder. That was his statement. And, and last is my favorite. A ship is always safe at shore. But that's not what it's built for. And that's Albert Einstein. So think about this. What kinds of things would we miss if we didn't let ourselves get uncomfortable? So here's a list of some things. But there's going to be other things that you're going to think of as I run through my list that I don't have here. How about this? Getting in shape. When you get in shape, it means you don't like the shape you have right now. You want to get in a different shape. Well, the shape you have right now came from one way or another, a lifestyle, whatever it was, but now you want to change it. So there's no easy way to do that. You've got to become uncomfortable. You have to set up a plan of action. You've got to follow a course of behavior change and all that to get in shape. You have to. How about this competing in events? When I run down on ocean through Pacific Grove, you see a lot of people jogging along there. And pre-COVID, a number of people would be training for certain races. Maybe you're one of those people that you have said, I want to complete a 5K. That's one of my goals. And you've never run that before. So now what do you have to do? You have to plan to be uncomfortable. You've got to run. Then you've got to run a little farther. Then you've got to run a little farther, a little faster in order to get in condition to complete the race, whether it's a 5K or a marathon or a triathlon, whatever it is, or a Spartan race. You have to get uncomfortable. How about losing weight? Losing weight. The American tradition is every January, we're flooded with counsel and advice and strategies and companies and promises on how we can lose weight. And you know what's interesting to me is <laughs> many of the advertised products or processes or plans will highlight, don't go through all that stress and sweat. Take this pill and lose weight every day. Or six and a half minutes a day and you can look like this. What they're saying is, stay in your comfort zone and lose weight and get in shape, which we know is ridiculous. And often, how do we get in that place where we want to lose weight? We eat a certain kind of food. What kind of food is it? Comfort food. Would you ever go to a smorgasbord that said, all the raw kale you want, all the sticks and rocks and, and water and fresh off the tree branches and leaves and all the organic stuff, you wouldn't. It wouldn't appeal to you. What appeals is comfort food, mashed potatoes, gravy, meatloaf, all, all kinds of biscuits, butter, all kinds of comfort food, right? Comfort. How about getting a degree? Many of you watching have a degree. Probably a number of you are also working on a degree or a vocational training certificate 
or some sort of evidence of having completed a course of study. Well, if you have a college degree, here's what I know. I've got a couple. How many classes did I have to take? I didn't want to take, didn't think I needed, but they held the diploma. And if I didn't do what they asked, I didn't get the diploma. So I had to go through the inconvenience and the discomfort of doing what I didn't want to do to reach the goal. How about learning a new job? And maybe it's a new job you didn't want to have to have because you lost your old job. But learning a new job, don't you, don't you have that first period of awkwardness? Like, oh, I'm walking around here. Everybody else knows what they're doing. They're working like this, and I don't know. And then you have somebody training you who clearly knows the whole system, and they have to remind themselves that you don't and slow down, then you, you're asking questions over and over. It's awkward and uncomfortable. Why do you keep doing it? One, you need the job. Two, you need the money from the job. And third, you probably know that if you stay with it long enough, you'll be one of those people that does it automatically down the line. Or memorizing scripture. You dig into God's word here and you decide, I'm going to memorize the book of Philippians. Well, unless you have a photographic memory, you read it and it's there. You've got to go through it. You've got to schedule it. You have to have some degree of discipline. And at times you don't want to practice, but you have to. Why? Because you won't reach the goal if you don't. Learning a new language. Oh, guilty. I have a minor in Spanish. I completed immersion training in college. I went to immersion training in Costa Rica. You like how I said that? Well, I should be on it every day, and I have a subscription to a training video, and I, I'm going to go there and watch it every day, and I don't. Why? Because sometimes I just don't want to, and i got to discipline myself, and it's getting convenient. So I know the stressors of not following through. Some of you maybe right now are dealing with changing careers, and this isn't a career change you wanted. It kind of happened because of the pandemic or something else. And you've got to go into this whole new field and learn all these different ways to do things and think and, and work and how you work and what you work with and equipment and tech and training. It's not easy. How about this? Maybe you have to go through the discomfort of setting boundaries in relationships. And see, it will be uncomfortable because you're setting the boundary. The others in the relationship are not at that time. You are. So they're going, what's going on? It may be uncomfortable to them and strange and weird. And, and they let you know, and you got to hold ground. It's like, oh, this is awkward and uncomfortable. Yet you do it. Why? Because you want to improve the health of that relationship. And how about this? Standing up for yourself or standing up for someone you care about when they're being oppressed or mistreated by someone else. That's uncomfortable, isn't it? Stand up. Speak out. Speak up. Risk the discomfort if it's something that's true and that you have to take a stand on. Or for someone else, you intervene and it's awkward and it's conflict and it's, it's all those things. These are things that would not happen if we didn't allow ourselves to become uncomfortable. So day in and day out, we kind of, kind of are people of comfort seeking, aren't we really? We kind of do. We want to be comfortable. I have comfortable shoes on. We want to be comfortable. And, and we just seek it. And that's where we have to challenge ourselves because you know what? There's a thing that I now call the terrible twos. But not T-W-O. I call it T-O-O. The terrible twos. Here's what I mean. This is us as comfort-seeking people. It's too hot. Oh, it's too cold. It's too tiring. Too limiting. It's too far. It's too close. Too unfamiliar. It's too late. It's too early. It's too unfamiliar. It's too windy. It's too muggy. Too wet. Too dry. Too high. Too low. Too different. Too stiff. Too soft too regimented, and it's just plain too hard. We're creatures of comfort. That's our natural tendency. So what is, so let's, a reminder here, I, I want to make sure we don't lose this, so we start, so you start hearing me and think, well, then all comfort's bad. It's not. Let me remind you, 
and tie some things together. In, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says this about comfort, and I'm going to highlight a word that occurs twice there. So when is comfort good for us? Well, Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in what? All our troubles. So that we can comfort who? Those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So scripture again tells us that comfort is right when it's for a time of trouble and good. But what might be the greatest discomfort of all? And I think it's facing truth. The greatest discomfort of all is facing truth. There's a man I love to watch. He's, he's an apologist, meaning defends the Christian faith, and he works for Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. And he had a whole different career and still uses that career. He lives in that career as an attorney in Chicago, but he also travels the world talking about Christianity and defending it. He was friends with Nabil Qureshi, who in 2017 passed away to be with the Lord at a very young age, but who was also an apologist for Christianity and a great friend of Shoreline Church. They were both Muslims, dedicated to being Muslim apologists, who found Jesus and became Christian apologists. So Nabil's with Jesus, but Abdul Murray is still here and very active and I got something from him, watching him not long ago. He talks about the many ways we avoid truth in daily life. Because we want to avoid the discomfort that comes with being frank and honest. And it isn't to say that we, we should say everything we think the moment we think that. Being kind and considerate, choosing carefully is always worth the effort. Always. But why would... Facing the truth be the greatest discomfort for us. Because the truth shakes us up. It inconveniences us. It rattles our comforts. It calls us out. It makes us look at ourselves. It exposes our hiding places and reveals who we really are. And among all the truth we might be uncomfortable with, what's the hardest truth of all to face? The hardest truth of all. Well, I submit to you, it's the truth found in a person, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus said in the 14th chapter of John, verse 6, and, and the scene here is he's preparing his disciples for his torture, his death on the cross, and his burial, and his resurrection, and they are traumatized by him leaving. And among many things, he says this. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Notice he doesn't say, I am the way and I tell the truth. He said, I am the truth. Jesus is truth embodied. So the question is, what makes us avoid facing him? you're on your app and you want to fill in the words, we have them right there. What makes us avoid facing him, believing him, and believing in him? Well, here's the answer. Facing him shakes us up. It shakes our carefully constructed lives, our patterns, our habits, our relationships, our connections, our worldview, and our vision for living. And that's a massive shift so, so what he offers has to outweigh the potential losses of embracing him. And see, if you're already a believer, you might be thinking, what losses? What is that? What's that? Well, I know a lot of non-believers, and I can speak for them and tell you what they often think of as are the losses they will incur if they leave that life and accept Jesus as their Savior. Often they think of, well, I have this stuff and I have these patterns and these friends and these things I do. And so if I give them up, there goes the fun, there goes the joy, there goes the happiness, there goes my friends. It's all gone. Now the secret 
that you know if you're a follower of Christ for any length of time, you know none of that is true. I'm a Christian, wasn't raised in Christianity, came to the Lord at 18. I don't have, I don't, I don't do any of that crazy stuff I used to do and I follow Jesus and I love it. I don't count it as loss at all. But we have to get in the mind of a non-believer. It can seem like, yeah, I'm gonna give all this up. It should outweigh it. It does outweigh it. But we have to be careful and look at it. If they're gonna get uncomfortable, if they're gonna go through this inconvenience, they're gonna deal with what others think about them and how they might treat them. We have to hit at least five things that help us understand how coming to Jesus outweighs what you might lose. Because of what he offers. First of all, grace, unearned love. In the book of Ephesians, Paul writes this. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's a gift, freely given. We can't earn it. That alone kind of astounds us. Everything else is earned. Why is this free? But it's because of God's great love for us. By grace. Next, forgiveness of sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. John says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If you don't have a way out of your sin, you don't know Jesus, first of all, you have to deny that you sin at all or admit you sin but try to forget about it or admit you sin but rewrite it and call it something else. I mean, you got to mess with it. And if you're just honest and you're a non-believer and you recognize I screw up all the time, that's an accumulative weight in a backpack that soon is far more than a backpack. It's crushing. And Jesus gave us the freedom. He goes, I'll pay that price. Just believe in me. I'll pay that. What a gift. Then we have eternity with him. John 3.16, one of the most beloved, well-known verses in all the Bible, all over the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So, so think of this. Sometimes even as a believer we think, well, I'm suffering now, but that someday I'll be in eternity with Jesus. Can I just tell you something? You're already in eternity with Jesus if you've accepted him as your savior. You know that? Eternity has already started for you. You're already an eternal being with him. We're all eternal beings, but you're an eternal being with him. So you'll change out of this tent, as Peter calls it in the first chapter of 2 Peter, this container, and you'll get a new body, but you're already in eternity. So man's greatest fear is resolved, the fear of death. True freedom, next. John 8, 31, 32 to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said this, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Fourth of July week, and what's it about? Freedom from oppression. Everybody ever born wants freedom. The only real freedom comes by way of Jesus Christ. And then we have a strong forever, forever family. It's a forever family, the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters, I can call you that. In Psalm 133, verse 1, I just love this kind of warm, engaging way it makes this statement. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. See, what we know as believers is we are unified in the essentials. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Giving your life to Jesus is the only way to be saved. And we have harmony in the non-essentials. We can disagree on things and talk about things, but we still have harmony. That's what goes on in the forever family. So I have some tough questions for you to ask yourself. Ask yourself this. Is seeking comfort of high importance to you? And in what ways? Just reflect on that. I, I have to look at that. There's some things that I go straight for comfort. Next, have you ever thought that being a Christian should make you feel uncomfortable? Why or why not? And next, have you avoid, avoided being uncomfortable even though you knew <clears throat> that God was leading you into that discomfort? What happened? 
I've been going on short-term mission trips for over 30 years, 35 years. I've done, I don't know how many, all over the world. Always to either a third world country or the third world part of a country. And I, four different experiences come to mind many years ago. Four times, I happened to be leading these four trips, and people came to me and said, I want to sign up. Um, I've always thought about it, but somebody mentioned it to me. Somebody encouraged me. My parents said, you need to do this. So I've been reluctant, but I'm signing up. So we go. And they're uncomfortable the whole time. Well, at first, I should say at first. But three or four days in, it kind of changes. And they're working with either the kids or the people we're helping. And then they invariably come to me and say, I get it. This is so neat. Gosh, my heart, I've never felt like this. I mean, I wept at this and I'm hugging and building and I'm, and I'm tired, but it's for a great reason. I just love this. I get it, I get it, I get it. And on these trips, we do devotions in the morning, wrap up of the day at night. So we come back from the trip. Traditionally, I would do three weeks later a gathering, share videos, photos, artifacts, and stories. Beautiful. A month after that event, the next trip signs up, and I go to those folks say, hey, I know you had a great time. I know it changed things for you. You ready to go? Dad, I yeah, I don't think so. I'm like, what? Yeah, I, I did it. I'm glad I did. I'm, okay, tell me, what's that about? Well, you know, I just was so uncomfortable. I just was uncomfortable. And this made me so sad to hear that. I mean, they have a right to feel that way. I'm not saying they should or shouldn't feel any way. But it made me sad because they risked the discomfort. They had a tremendous impact on people's lives. They were impacted, but then they shut it down. How about you? Where in your life are you currently uncomfortable? And is it possible that God is working in your discomfort? And if so, how is he doing that? How is he doing that? I have a challenge for us. I have a challenge. Are you willing to be uncomfortable in any area of your life so growth can happen? And, and are you willing to be uncomfortable to help someone else that stretches you? Are you willing to be uncomfortable to advocate for people who need an advocate? Are you willing to do that? It's inconvenient. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. It's weird. Would you push through it? Ask God about that. Are you willing to be uncomfortable in order to be in the presence of Jesus? Maybe there's another step you could take forward that would be a real challenge. You'd feel, feel vulnerable. You'd feel at risk a little bit like, I, man, I'm in my comfort zone with him too. I don't want to get outside of this. Pray about that. Think about it. How will you take the next uncomfortable, inconvenient step? How will you do that? Well, so this morning and last week, we've redefined a couple of very common terms. We redefined success. This morning, we're redefining comfort, especially for a believer. I want to encourage you to be uncomfortable. I hope you've been uncomfortable through this whole message. I, I really do. I hope you're a little bit rattled, a little bit like, ugh. You know, something, shake it up. Because that's where Jesus does great work. Let the Holy Spirit come in and move you and bring you out of that comfort zone where it's comfortable, but maybe not so alive. Will you risk being unsettled on your road to success as you walk with Jesus? My hope is that you will. So, so that's why I say comfort's the enemy all the things that I've experienced in my life and I'm still experiencing today that, that I treasure most are things where I've stretched, risked discomfort with Jesus and in just living. Take the next step of discomfort and inconvenience for his sake this morning. I encourage you. Let's pray. Precious Lord, I just thank you for the reality that you, Jesus, risked incredible discomfort. All through the Gospels, we read how you, 
You astound and amaze people with your teaching and you upset the established religious leadership and you stunned people and you never took the easy way out. You did everything in its time and you risked it all. And then when you were brought to trial, you wouldn't even defend yourself because it required no defense. You willingly went into that terrible place of torture and separation from the Father for our sake. You risked it all. You suffered. You told us if we follow you, we will suffer. We will be uncomfortable. We will be inconvenienced. Father, lead us that way. Never let us get too settled, too satisfied, too complacent. Don't ever let it happen. There's too much work to be done for the kingdom, Father. Speak to every single person watching right now as you speak to me. Because our plans are all different. Let us hear you speak to us. I pray this. I thank you for this, for what's already been done and is happening now, but even more for what's to come. And I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I thank you for joining us this morning, and I want to let you know a couple of things before I send you off with a, a closing word of blessing. If you need prayer for anything, anything at all, please call that number on your screen or email prayer at shoreline.church. You know, we became so accustomed and so grateful all the years we were able to do church in person here that people would come forward after a church service. And now we can't really do it the same way. We're at home, a lot of you. And, but please don't let that get in the way. Would you risk the discomfort of calling for prayer if that's what you really need? We have people ready to pray with you. We love praying with you. Please consider that. If you're new to Shoreline and you want more information on our church, just text WELCOME. Text WELCOME so we can welcome you properly. And if you have any other questions, any questions at all, we're ready to address them, answer them, connect you with people who can answer them. We're here for you. So I'm so glad you joined us this morning. I want to send you out with this. As we finish today and you leave online, you go. You're done watching and you go into your day. Take the challenges I gave you and ask God to make you uncomfortable. And why? For your growth and development, for his glory, and to do the work he planned for you to do before you even came into this world. God bless you. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you soon.